We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Hello, and welcome to Geekdom of God. I'm your host, Siantir, and today I want to talk about hope. Hope is an incredibly important quality of Christianity, but I feel like it gets shortchanged compared to faith and love, the other two of the three things that remain that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 13.13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. But I've gotten somewhat ahead of myself. There are two ways in which we use the word hope, and one of them is the way that it is used in the context of the verse above, while the other is not. The ordinary definition of hope is something wished for, as seen in statements like, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, or I'd hoped to go to the zoo today. It is not the type of hope of which I am speaking. Rather, I am speaking of a hope that is an anticipation of what is sure to come. It's looking forward to the fulfillment of plans made. In the case of what I'm talking about today, it is hope in God's promises, as Hebrews 10.23 asserts. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Ultimately, the hope of Christianity is twofold. The first aspect is a hope in the resurrection from the dead. The second is a hope in eternal life with God. The reason these are hopes is that they are things we don't yet have, but trust in God to deliver. We trust in God to deliver on them because we believe that he has promised them. This, of course, relies on faith in the Bible. The hope for the resurrection of the dead is based on Christ's resurrection. Without this event, Christianity would not be what it is. Indeed, Paul words it quite bluntly in 1 Corinthians 16, 15 to 19. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. This, then, is the combined hopes of Christianity, that Christ has been raised, and thus sins forgiven and the promise of resurrection proven. If sins are forgiven, then we can live with God, who is very good to live with. In 1 Corinthians 15, 42-44a, Paul describes the resurrected body in this way. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. It should be noted that when the Bible says a spiritual body, it does not mean a body that is not physical, but rather it is speaking about the internal nature of the body. A body that is natural is ruled by sin, while a spiritual body is ruled by the spirit. We know this because Jesus' resurrected body was most definitely physical as Luke 24, 36-39 states. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And so we are presented with this hope of a resurrected body and the ability to exist in a sinless society with God, as is written in Revelation 21, 2-4. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. The fact that this is a sinless society is part of why it is so appealing and worth hoping for. This is because suffering is due to sin, because sin is disobedience to God, and God's command is that we love each other. Therefore, in a sinless society, there is no human cruelty. Furthermore, because our God will be God himself, rather than worthless idols like money, fame, sex, each other, etc., we will have a God that is reliable. In my opinion, both of these things are highly desirable. Combined, they form a true utopia, one without blemish or fault. The hope of Christianity is to be able to live in this true utopia forever, in perfect relationship with God and each other. The promise of heaven isn't merely sitting around playing harps on clouds for all eternity. It is clear from what little we know that it is something truly desirable, but the full details of that are beyond the scope of this episode. My final thought on this matter is this. As Christians, our hope in God and who he is should be evident in our behavior. Our hope in a resurrection and of a perfect eternal society should mean that we don't put our hope in earthly things. If we put our hope in earthly things, money, political leaders, fame, a legacy, what sort of hope is that? For we know that those things will all pass away. 
And what sort of witness do we have if we behave no differently than the world? Let us live lives filled with hope in God, a hope that inspires people to wonder at the nature of it, that we may have a fruitful witness before them. There is a reason Peter instructs us to be prepared to share about the source of our hope in 1 Peter 3, 15-16. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Such a hope gives great endurance in the face of the many trials of life. May it be a witness to the lost, a beacon to direct them toward the hope-inspiring work of Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for listening. Until next time, take care everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this week's Geekdom of God podcast. To support this program, go to patreon.com slash cntier. For more, you can visit geekdomofgod.com. Finally, you can email Santir at santir at geekdomofgod.com.